Let's go a little bit deeper into what a VM is with virtual volumes. What is what's what comprises a virtual machine when it comes to virtual volumes? Well, let's take our old VM again. And when we create a virtual machine, what actually happens on the array? What's created? Well, when you first create a new VM, or you're cloning from a source VM, or you're doing a storage vMotion um, from a different data store, on the array, a couple of different things get created. Every VM has what they call a config vVol. A config vVol is usually four gigs in size, and it holds the configuration information of that VM virtual hardware descriptions, some pointer files, some logs, like hey, how many NICs do you have? What network are they connected to? That's all stored in this config vVault. And then as you add virtual disks, there are data vVaults, right? For every virtual disk, you have a corresponding data vVault, right? It's sized to whatever you specify when you create it. When you resize it, this is resized on the array. When you delete it from that virtual machine, this data vVol is deleted from the array. Now on the flash array, we have our destroyed volumes folder. So if you delete it from the VM, it actually goes in here for 24 hours. And so this actually gives you some nice, oops, I deleted my virtual disk I didn't mean to, recovery times when using vVols on the flash array. Now, the next part of this is memory. When you create a virtual machine on vMFS or NFS, a swap file is allocated when it gets powered on. When you power it off, that swap file gets deleted. And this is no different with virtual volumes. When you power on a virtual machine that's using vVols, it creates a swap vVol. When you power it off, this gets deleted from the array. There's a lot of benefits around this, this automation. One thing like unmap. With unmap, the underlying array doesn't know when something's been deleted on a file system, so you have to issue unmap and say, hey, this capacity can be reclaimed. With vVols, when you delete it from VMware, the array knows and it deallocates the space, so it's far more efficient. So the next portion of this is snapshots. Right, so what, what do snapshots look like today on VMFS when it comes to VMware snapshots? So if I have my VM and I have a little virtual disk, and if I create a snapshot, what happens is a delta VMDK file has. So this is what we would call this our, our VMDK and this is our delta. All new writes get stored in this delta file, and reads get redirected as such. And your latency will go up when this VMware snapshot exists. Right? And when you need to delete it, it has to reconsolidate all these blocks back into this original VMDK. And so the, the existence of this VMware snapshot, the deletion of that VMware snapshot, is a performance penalty. But when using vVols, the snapshot changes. Because now, because a Data vVol is a volume on the array. Instead of this whole delta VMDK thing, it creates an array-based snapshot. This snapshot is your traditional array-based snapshot. And on the flash array, we can create snapshots instantaneously. We can restore from them, clone from them instantaneously. Right? And there is no performance impact to having them exist. So you can create and manage your VMware snapshots just like you did before with VMFS, but now you can actually keep them around for much longer. So this granularity of how the vVols work gives you some benefits, and that automatically moves to using, being able to leverage array-based snapshots. So you can use those VMware snapshots as they were really intended for, not just quick restores, but longer-term retention or even dev tests. So the next question you might have about virtual volumes is how are these volumes connected, right? It sounds like there could be a lot of volumes, right? I mean, each virtual machine could possibly have 50, 60 virtual volumes, right? If you max out how many they can have. And, and servers are more powerful, so they can run a lot more VMs than they used to, right? So you could conceivably have hundreds and hundreds, possibly a thousand, right? Virtual volumes presented to a single host. So how is this managed? VMware has current limits right now on how many SCSI devices they can handle. ESX can do 512 devices or 2,000 logical paths, whichever limit you run into first. And from a virtual volume perspective, this could be a problem. And furthermore, every time you present a new SCSI device, you have to rescan the SCSI bus, which at large environments, this is, can be a performance problem. Right? And so VMware understood these issues, and they realized they had to do something differently with virtual volumes. So what do they do? Well, let's uh, take the case here. We have two ESX servers. 
So ESX, ESX. Now, when I create a virtual machine, let's say I create it on this one, on the array, um, I'm going to create, I don't know, two data vvols. And then I'll have my config vvol as well. Config, data, data. Now, how are these presented and connected? Well, what's been introduced here is a concept called a protocol endpoint. A protocol endpoint is a volume of zero capacity that kind of acts as a mount point for your virtual volumes. This is the only volume that you connect and rescan to see, and you do it once for that host for that array, and that's it. When you create a VM, VMware has the array create these virtual volumes. But this host or that host doesn't actually need these virtual volumes connected right now. The VM is not powered on. When you power on this virtual machine, what happens is that it binds these VVOLs through this protocol endpoint to the host running that virtual machine automatically. And what does binding mean? Well, protocol endpoint is going to be, let's say it's LUN 255. And this might be LUN 6, 7, and 8. What actually happens is this is LUN 255 colon 6, 255 colon 7, 255 colon 8. They are sub LUNs through this protocol endpoint. And what this allows is two things. Scale, right? You can have 16,000 VVOLs bound through a single protocol endpoint, so a lot more than here. Furthermore, to see sub LUNs, you don't need to do a SCSI bus rescan. VMware issues a report LUNs to this protocol endpoint, and it says, oh yeah, these are my VVOLs underneath it. It is a very cheap, quick, and inexpensive operation to discover these volumes. And so this really opens up the scale without running into performance issues at scale. The protocol endpoint is also the only thing that you have pathing set to. And so even though you might have a thousand virtual volumes underneath it, you still may only have actually four logical paths, right? And so this pathing limit easily valid for what you need for virtual volumes. So now, when you power off this VM, these sub LUN connections are automatically removed. If you vMotion this VM to a different host, these sub LUN connections are redirected through either this PE to that host or a different protocol endpoint to that host. VMware automatically controls the connections and disconnections of all your virtual volumes through the existing protocol endpoints. So there's no need to, well, first off, pre-provision in your storage. And number two, there's no need for you to ever manually connect or disconnect that storage. This is all done automatically by VMware in coordination with your array. So how does VMware communicate with the array to do all this stuff? And how does it tell the array, create this volume, resize this volume, replicate this volume, snapshot this VM? Well, there is a communication interface between VMware and the underlying array. So what VMware refers to this as is VASA. This is the VMware API for storage awareness. VASA has been around for some time. It was originally introduced in vSphere 5.0 for some very basic communication around, hey, this VMFS is configured as such. Then VASA 2.0 was introduced in vSphere 6.0. This was the first release from, for virtual volumes from VMware. Right, this is the first VASA release that could create VVOLs, snapshot, talk to the array to do all this type of stuff. And then in vSphere 6.5, VASA 3 came out. VASA 3, the main difference between it and VASA 2, was support for array-based replication. With VASA 2 and VVOLs, arrays could replicate VVOLs, but VMware didn't know about it and they didn't know how to manage it. And more importantly, they didn't know how to fail it over automatically. And this was a core part of VASA 3.0. So let's talk about what is VASA, how is it deployed, and how is it managed. Well, VASA is a provider. It's a provider that the storage vendor builds to be able to receive and communicate calls from VMware. And so what we did on the flash array is we simplified it as much as possible. So on the flash array, we have two controllers, 0 and 1. When you upgrade to our purity operating environment that supports VVOLs, we automatically configure a VAS provider on both controllers. And these are both active-active. So either one of these can accept VASA calls from VMware. An important part about this, other than the fact that you don't need to install anything, you don't need to configure anything, it's just ready to go, 
is that it's entirely stateless. Right? Our controllers do not have any state. The GUI, the REST API, the CLI, even Purity runs inside of it. But if you were to lose both of your controllers, how do you restore your array? Well, you just replace them. Or if they lose power, how do you restore it? You just boot it back up. Same thing for our VOS provider. It is entirely item potent, meaning that it picks up where it left off. So there is no need to, first off, worry about high availability with your VOS provider on the flash array because it's, it's on both controllers, it's built in. And furthermore, you don't have to worry about backup or restore or configuration of it because it's automatically done by Purity when it's restored, when it's brought back up. So this simplifies the VASA deployment and management of your VMware environment. So another point about VASA is that it is not in the data path. If you have a VM running and it has some VVOLs on an array and somehow your VAS provider goes away and VMware can't communicate with it, your VMs continue to run. The execution of IO to your VVOLs through your protocol endpoint is not controlled or managed or in the path with the VAS provider, right? So if somehow this goes down, your VMs continue to run. So this is an important part, and this is why these are separated. There's the control path, VASA, and then there's the data path, VVOLs protocol endpoint. So on the Flash Array, we support VASA version 3. And so what this means is that we include our array-based replication support into our VASA capabilities. So if you want to have a VM replicated, have it replicated at a certain interval, have it replicated to a certain number of targets, you can do that inside of VMware storage profiles, leveraging our capabilities to make sure that your VMs are protected, leveraging the Flash Array array-based replication as needed and desired by the application running inside of it. So that's the deeper architecture of virtual volumes, protocol endpoints, VOS provider, what VVOLs actually are. But above and beyond all of that, there is additional value that can be added by things like the flash array. So watch part three of this video series on some of the data mobility benefits that the flash array and VVOLs provide to your VMware environment.